On my first trip to sea, I lost my friend in a deep tank. We were supposed to be cleaning down there. The tank had been open all night for ventilation. He went ahead to get things ready. When we went there, about five minutes later, we looked down, we saw his body at the bottom of the tank. We took his body out in the rope on the windlass. And as it came up, I always remember that his body was shaking with the vibration of the windlass. And his arms were out like that. We put him in canvas that night, sewed him up. Next day, we buried him at sea. It was wrong. In close spaces, we're killing people then, 50 years ago, and in close spaces are killing people today. And what we've got to all start thinking is just how many of us, how many of you out there, are going to die before it stops. Preventing deaths in enclosed spaces at sea is probably the biggest single challenge faced by the maritime industry, and with good reason. On our ships, we have a lot of enclosed spaces. Cargo and ballast tanks, cargo holds, storerooms, pump rooms, fuel tanks, sewage tanks, chain lockers, void spaces, fridge spaces, paint lockers, coffer dams, double bottoms, engine crankcases, even open tank hatches on deck. They are defined as enclosed spaces because often there are limited openings for entry and exit, little or no natural ventilation, and because they are not designed to be occupied on a continual basis. What we all need to understand is that these are the spaces that kill. They kill on tankers, on cruise ships, on bulk carriers. They kill on ships where the procedures are in place. They kill on ships where everybody knows the rules. And why? Because the hazards have not been identified, the risks have not been considered, the safe way of working not established, no proper procedures, in many cases, the only thing handed out is a death sentence. People dying because of hydrocarbon vapors from sludge, scale, or cargo residues. From gases such as nitrogen, benzene, and hydrogen sulfide. Dying because of oxygen deficiency. People ending up dead because they tripped, slipped, or fell. Because they drowned. Ending up dead because they entered an enclosed space and nobody knew they were there. Help! Help! People dying in enclosed spaces, not because they couldn't get out, but because they were unprepared and should never have entered in the first place. The message is clear. If we can avoid entering an enclosed space, then we should do so. But of course, there are legitimate reasons why we have to go into them. Surveyors need to carry out surveys. Painters need to paint. There are valves that need fixing, tanks that need cleaning. There could be damage that needs to be quickly assessed and then repaired. There must be safeguards in place to protect the people going in from any identified hazard. And there must be clearly understood procedures for controlling the entry and monitoring the task inside. In other words, enclosed space entry should be properly managed. But most of the people who die in enclosed spaces die not because they didn't know about the procedures, but because they didn't follow them. In a lot of cases, because people thought the procedures took too long. It's a five minute job, so what's the problem? Who needs all this paperwork? 
But the biggest problem is that people enter an enclosed space which has not been identified as potentially dangerous, so they think the procedures don't apply. These are the spaces that change. The spaces that may have been perfectly safe yesterday, yet today they are deadly. Spaces that are entered time and time again with no problem, yet kill people when circumstances change. But the majority of people who die are not those who first enter an enclosed space and then get into difficulty. It is those who attempt to rescue them. They die because they are not trained, because instinct takes over and becomes more powerful than the knowledge gained from training. They die because instinct kills. An emergency rescue has to be carried out by people who know exactly what they are doing. Spaces such as deep tanks double bottoms are extremely confined and getting people out of them is never going to be easy. And that is precisely why rescue techniques and the use of emergency equipment must be fully understood and practiced on a regular basis. Having the right equipment on board the ship is very important. The next thing is, can you use that equipment? And you only find out if you can use it by training with it. Isn't it strange? We do training for fire, we do training for grounding, we do training for man overboard, but what about enclosed spaces? And yet more people are being killed in enclosed spaces than in all the others. Realistic exercises in different places, in different situations, and some of them can be difficult, but that's what it's all about. To make sure drills are realistic, they should reflect what would happen if the drill was actually a real emergency. In some situations, a rescue from a deep tank, for example, the tripod is the easiest and often the only way of getting people out of enclosed spaces. Depending on the space, it may also be the safest way of getting people in. The original emergency could have resulted from fire, heat exhaustion, smoke, toxic fumes. The rescue team must take care and use the principles of dynamic risk assessment, which means continually monitoring the environment. If there is restricted visibility, care should be taken to avoid injuries from slips, trips and falls. When a casualty is found and identified, the rescue party must always assume that he or she is still alive and, if necessary, provide immediate medical attention the most serious condition should be dealt with first. In this case, trying to restore breathing. The officer of the watch should be kept fully informed at every stage of the rescue. All members of the rescue team should be fully competent in providing first aid. Having got to the casualty, it's not going to help if the wrong medical attention is given and the situation ends up a whole lot worse. But first aid apart, the casualties have still got to be taken out of the space, and that requires specialist training. Initial training may be shore-based, using simulators able to create risk-free, realistic scenarios, including fire and smoke. Basic equipment can be introduced and rescue techniques explored, but the training must be evaluated on board by carrying out drills involving the ship's own personnel and onboard equipment and using the enclosed spaces on that particular ship. When the rescue operation is complete, the master or chief officer is notified 
and the ship can return to normal routine. Enclosed spaces on ships are a fact of life. They come with a job, but far too many people are dying in them. In some cases, death occurs quickly, sometimes instantly. But many seafarers do have the chance of survival, provided that correct emergency procedures are followed, provided that the rescue party works as a team with the knowledge not just of how to do the task, but of the capabilities of the equipment used. Best practice requires an enclosed space rescue team to be established on each ship, and that team members train together with dedicated rescue equipment. Seafarers could be saved, provided that the training and the expertise to get them out is there when needed. <laughs> 